Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The 14th Sunday after Pentecost falls on September 3rd, 2023. And the texts are Jeremiah 15, 15 through 21, or you might be reading Exodus 3, 1 through 15. We'll be looking at Psalm 26, 1 through 8, Romans 12, 9 through 21, and from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. This is the traditional last weekend of summer in the United States and parts of the Northern Hemisphere, which means, uh, I don't know what it means, be a church. Labor Day weekend in America, it's, it sometimes is a rough day at church to, <laughs> um, to uh, get people in and people are, uh, your, your lay volunteers are eagerly waiting to launch things next weekend, right. Right. but you, preacher, left everybody hanging last week with Jesus as the Messiah. Mm-hmm. and wondering yes. what that was all about. Mm-hmm. And so now you get now to, we, uh, yeah, if you're a gospel preacher, you get to finish that story. Gotta finish that and story. now we find out a little bit about what it is. Exactly. And so it's not necessarily, the way Matthew frames it, it's not necessarily immediate. From that time on, Jesus started to show his disciples. You get the sense that this is now uh, iterative. This is over and over again. He's, he's, um, he's talking about the suffering and, and death to come uh, at the hands of the most powerful people in Judean uh, Judaism um, and also to be raised. And then Peter's just like had enough. And he's like, did you not pay any attention to Caesarea Philippi where I told you you were the Messiah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that just doesn't go well for Peter, but uh, you know, I, I, it's an interesting way that it, he frames it. The, the The distinction here is not necessarily what you want versus God wants. So that's part of it. It's not necessarily evil versus good. It's just um, you're thinking like a you're you're thinking like a human being, um, and not and not thinking about divine things. Um, in other words, I think that means not you're stupid, but your perspective is woefully limited, um, too small. You're thinking, you're thinking too small. You're not thinking um, in terms of what's possible here, and that still means nothing until we get to chapter twenty-eight. <laughs> right, right, but I appreciate your um, distinguishing against that binary uh, of you know that th- that all of this is a journey, you know, f- from you know wandering in the wilderness to you know the walking with Jesus. And, you know, we have this, what we described last week as a, as a turning point in, in, in Matthew's gospel, where now Jesus is named, and yet there isn't full comprehension of exactly what God is doing. There isn't full comprehension. And, and so um, there'll be other verses that will, will, uh, will speak to this, but we have to be patient with one another to recognize um, we can get it and then in the very next moment still acknowledge that we need to seek God's will, seek God's, uh, to discern God's ideas, um, even among the community of the faithful. And that's why we need to show up um, on this holiday weekend for church. (laughs) Yeah, I, I think the I think both of those, that direction is, is really important that, what what now happens between you know for the rest of the gospel is an unfolding of what the messiah what it means to call jesus the messiah which we talked about last week right that uh that here you make this you, you there is this confession but what that confession actually means is now is now going to uh un, yeah unfold throughout the rest of the the gospel and uh, and so it it kind of goes back a little bit too in terms of uh, what I mentioned last week with the binding and loosing. Uh, it's it's going to be a moment of it's going to be these ongoing moments, uh, interpretive moments of of you know how how is this 
uh, how is this act or how is this teaching revelatory of a revelation of what of what Jesus as the Messiah means. And uh, and that's why the, you know, then the latter part of the passage becomes really important because I because it it really is this sense of of how you know this denial and saving your own life is uh it, it really has to do with how is it that you know and the stumbling block how is it that you are um hindering others from experiencing and and seeing the possibility of the messiah um where does it become your own and that's why this that's why the confession piece it that it's plural, I think becomes really important that it's not, this is not your own self-interest, uh, you know, saving your own life to call Jesus your Messiah, but it's, it's for the sake of the community. It's for the sake of your neighbor. It's for the sake of the world. And so the, that's part of, I, that's part of the discernment process that the disciples are going to need to engage, I think, going forward. A couple of months ago, uh, I think it was in May, um, um, uh, Kate Bowler on her uh, podcast, Everything Happens, uh, did an interview with Miroslav Volf where they talk about um, what, is a, what, what, what is a joyful life? What, what does it mean to, to live, live a joyful life? And uh, it's, it, it, your, your comments reminded me of, of that podcast because it's not what we expect. And uh, if you know Kate Bowler's work, so often we think this salvation thing is about what I get. It, it's, 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 it, it is profit for me. Uh, it's betterment for me. It's a benefit for me. And um, the reality is it's not. It is always about who do you say Jesus is and therefore who is the God that is made known in Jesus. And that's going to continually be the journey we're on, uh, to recognize that for all of the good of glimpsing the kingdom of God, that's not the end, is that what we are doing is we are becoming what humanity was created to be. And that is evidence that God is, and that God is good, and that God hasn't given up on reigning on earth in a way that offers peace and unity and, and distributes hospitality. And so we're going to, we're, we too are going to continue to be in that journey of, I believe, do people see in my actions that I've benefited or do they benefit because I'm pointing them to the God who is blessing us all? That's a challenge for us. And, and so, yeah, that second, that end of this portion of the passage is a little bit harder. Um, it's a little bit more of a challenge, and yet it's an important move for us to make. I really appreciated the, uh, the commentary on this text as well. Um, particularly, there's one, one line that I would point our preachers to, because the church says no to Jesus, <laughs> Uh, Jesus way far too often, we need like the disciples to be reminded of the differences of what cross bearing, what denial means, self denial. Uh, and, and, and as you said, joy, that it, that it's really within the context of that, you know, the, the larger, uh, the larger good. Um, and which I think, you know, uh, it's a, which is an interesting way to imagine this Sunday, you know, in the lives of, of people as, as people are coming back to, you know, thinking about closing out the summer and things are starting new. Um, yeah, that could be also a good connection there. And if, as Matt alluded to, that next week are the start of all of the programs in the fall for, for your community, um, just as going back to school uh, would be as well in the larger community, what are uh, leaning back from from last week? What are the what are the gifts and graces that are being offered up um, in the name of Jesus, in the name of this one who um, uh, enables us by the Spirit to be glimpses of the reign of God? 
Um, so all of the programming ultimately is about pointing to Jesus again. I think it was Calvin who said, actually, I know it was Calvin who said that self-denial is the sum of the Christian life. I think he said it was some, but S-U-M. Um, and, and getting at this passage and, and its parallels of, of what that looks like. Um, I know everybody's rolling their eyes when you talk about Calvin and denial, but it's uh, it's a really good part of the Institutes. It really is. And this is... Um, it, this is where Jesus is now teaching his disciples what it means to be a disciple. I mean, they have shared in the ministry, but now he's impressing upon them that the way of the cross is a calling of the church and a hallmark of, of the church. And that's almost always ugly and abusive when that's put on a single person. But yes. to talk about this means for a community, to be a community of cross bearers or to be a community of, of self-denial and what that looks like in the in the rhythms and the ups and downs and the the triumphs and tragedies of of life and of communal life um <clears throat> but to think about that and to even ask i don't know if i put this in a sermon but somehow to pose to a congregation in what way has this specific congregation been called to suffer on behalf of the gospel i don't mean go seek that out but i mean with whom are you going to align yourself where are the places in your community where you can go um, and model this kind of, of self-denial, not in something that's going to get picked up in the newspaper necessarily, but, but what does that look like? And if you're in a season where people are ill or dying, you know, when the, when the community is having a rough time or leadership transitions, I mean, to, to think about how is this a process where, again, as a community as a whole finds the strength of, of this new society of disciples that Jesus seems to imagine here. A million caveats attached to that, right? It's going to all get really perverse in a hurry if you're not careful. And if you start to glorify suffering for its own sake. Okay. So that, yeah, exactly. Because that's where I'm going to, uh, if, if you're, if you two are okay with this, this is where the Jeremiah passage, the brain is a little. Don't like it. No. I don't because because it of that focus on the suffering and that when we talk about being cross bearers, that is all too frequently or, you know, take up your cross that all too frequently gets aligned exclusively with suffering mm -hmm. and with and the way in which uh, the way in which suffering is is necessary. <laughs> Uh, for the for the sake of being a follower of Jesus, or the way in which uh, suffering is even then justified uh, and theologized, over theologized, and so that's where I think our conversation has is helpful and important in that, and, and it's and it connects to what you said at the end there, Matt, is that to be a cross bearer is to make decisions on where you align yourself. Exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's what, what, what will you take up uh, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven? And what will you, you know, what will you reject and what will you deny? What, when will you call out, you know, the, the truth of the, uh, of the evil powers of empire. Mm -hmm. um, and because, because, the way in which the cross has also become so over theologized. And at the end of the day, it was an indictment of empire. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what empire does when it, when you go up against it. And so this is what you can expect. And so that is a denial of self because it means that you're not saving your, you know what, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is so much of how we go about our lives, right? I'm going to save my own. Mm -hmm. And, and and not put myself on the line. So the, so the Jeremiah, that's my problem with the Jeremiah passages. It, and, and I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going to hold a Jeremiah uh, because there are moments when um, because you've taken up the cause, the powers that be are in the position, um, uh, you know, to, to, um, uh, to hurt you, to harm you, to yeah, um, all true. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, to to marginalize you. That's the word I'm looking for. And if if that's, you know, it, it's just a reminder of where is your community. 
you know, the community you've aligned yourself with to, 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 to stay, I'm, you know, this isn't an either or, I don't want it to be read that way. Um, but the community of you, where are they? They may be the marginalized. They may be the ostracized. They may be the ones that the empire, the powers that be have cut off. And if you're at that moment with them, asking them, um, ignoring their, their, their pain, and asking them um, to take on someone else's burden, it's almost like, you know, I, I, you know, God's got me down here in this hole. I'm not sure I want to pull anybody else down there with me. But reading the fact that Jeremiah is, is able to say, remember me, visit me, expect that, N know that God will hear when I call and that I can name the reality that I'm in. And to hear God say, you know, turn back rather than turn away. Um, and, and I just want to say this, in, in some ways, this Jeremiah passage anticipates next week's psalm. Uh, so not, not the psalm from this week, but the, 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 the psalm from next week, where we're actually calling out uh, on, uh, calling out to the name of the, of the Lord God. So know your congregation, know where they are, know, you know, are they the empire? Are they marginalized by the empire? Have they been squashed? You know, um, and I guess that's sort of the, the joy of having the alternative set text as well, is that if you're faithful to the community that you're in, this week might be the week you preach this instead of that. And, and we're giving you commentary on each of them, but you know your people. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's a living word for them. Yeah, don't assume all suffering is the same. When the New Testament glamorizes suffering or at least commends suffering, it's almost always in the context of the blowback you get for Being uh, the stance you take in following Jesus. It's... Yep. Anyway, Exodus 3, a lovely story. Beautiful story, fun story. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna. I, I think I may have said this uh, last time this came around, um, but I want to lead with, um, and, and and this sort of falls out of the fact that we were talking about the communities that we are 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 serving. We're talking uh, about church people in in a lot of our our commentaries. Um, every once in a while, we we need to remember that we also speak to those who visit, drop in, show up, who might not yet believe. And uh, a few years ago, I had um, uh, uh, a uh, message from this text that was um, uh, written in a creative preaching class um, from a person who doesn't believe, um, but was faithful to what this text describes. And uh, I want to lift it up in terms of what it means to sometimes preach what the text says, even if you're not sure you believe God speaks, even if you're not sure you believe God shows up, even if you're not sure you want to believe that this was a holy moment from Moses. In the ancient wisdom of this community, that's exactly what is written here. And so what this particular message did was it described the um, the evening sky where the sun paints the sky a brilliant orange that would look like a fire burn uh, if you, as you look through the bushes and and in that um, the writer was faithful to the text but also honest to say. Some people would call this a God moment. Some people would say they that this was a call moment. Some people would say God spoke. And then he added, I wouldn't, because he knew his congregation knew he didn't hold that faith. But then he went on to say, for those who did hear this, this is where Moses turned to become one who acts in the name of God to liberate a people. And so he preached faithfully this text, even though it was beyond what he could claim as his own faith. And 
Um, it was brilliantly done and a challenge for me when I get a text I don't like and I know what it says and I feel compelled by the spirit. In this case, he was compelled by the by the professor, but I feel compelled by the spirit to preach it. Um, it can be done uh, and it can be done in a way that is liberating and life-giving to our hearers. So I'll circle back to say sometimes we have to preach to those who don't yet believe. And we might need to do that with this text. Here's an opportunity. Now exegete the beauty of the text. <laughs> that was my homiletical lecture. Matt, what do you, why do you like this story? Because there's a bush on fire in the middle of the wilderness. <laughs> it's so weird. I know. <laughs> um, the you know and the term that's used to describe it is apparently an obscure Hebrew word that doesn't show up much and so one of the one of the ways the rabbis dealt with that is to just assume this is like the most obscure scrawny little thorn bush you've ever seen like it's just an absolute waste of space in the desert you know kind of a uh, but that's where God chooses to be present right in the most humble of vegetation right a plant with just no use whatsoever. <laughs> um, and then the line, right, where Moses says, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up <laughs> is a great line because well, just nobody talks like that is one, <laughs> one problem. But it's um, Moses is curious in this. And there are also there, in the rabbinic tradition, there's uh, some have proposed that this bush was always there and was always on fire since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm, and right. Moses is the first person to bother to stop and look at it. Yes. Um, which is also a beautiful reading. Yes. That Moses is attentive. And that's what the that's what theologians are. Good ones are attentive, and that's what leaders are. Like they're attentive and they're curious, and they know you have to pay attention to the world around you and to the people around you. And so this isn't just a, 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 um, <clears throat> a theophany. Of a, of a dumb or a resistant or otherwise clueless would-be prophet. There's something about Moses that already shows signs of, his, of this curiosity um, that makes him a good, a good uh, ally with God and the work that God's going to do. Nice. Yeah, I love, and I, yeah, and building off of that, you know, that this is God's, this is God's ally. I love the, the back and forth as Moses is trying to figure out, figure this out, uh, and, and, you know, and really trying to figure out, you know, why this bush is not burning up. Uh, but I love the back and forth where Moses says to God, who am I, right? That I should go to Pharaoh. And I love that God doesn't answer that. <laughs> uh, you know, God says, I'm going to be with you. Uh, and, and that 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 what who is who who is Moses has yet to be. Uh, but but he enters you know he enters into this 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 relationship with God and that God uh, calls him, and that uh, and that you know if I you know if I come to the Israelites and the, the God of your ancestors has sent me and they ask me what is his name what shall I say to them. Uh, and so that back and forth of of Moses really working out or asking these questions of God, I also love um, in that it just it it's not this you know here I am and off you go. It's just like it's really trying to figure out well here I am, but now who am I <laughs> that God has called me. And, uh, and so I, I, I love that interplay. Um, and I think it's a, a beautiful sort of, um, uh, encapsulation of our own relationship with God that, and God calls, and then it causes us to say, well, who am I? And, and well, and isn't that what we're going to figure out together? Uh, which is something I really like about that. And if it's Saturday and you've just tuned in, and you don't know what to do with all of that, just take the commentary that Kim Rousseau gives us and preach it. Give her credit. But um, that the commentary is, is, is beautiful. 
Um, and and you, can, you can just about preach it. Good. Psalm, the psalm, anything about the psalm we want to say? Uh, I think this psalm matches Jeremiah or the crying out of those in Egypt that God is sending Moses back to, to liberate. Um, so here we are again uh, with, the, with the psalm being the very words um, of those who are crying out to God. Yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> you know that that in many ways that's what our that's what our hymnody does that's what our yeah. that's what our best poems do um and and so the, the you know this is the the ancient hymnal uh this is you know the iPod favorite playlist and sometimes when you don't have words you just you know press that play button and and hear those those familiar passages uh and 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 so yeah, this is kind of a liturg liturgical use again. I agree. So Romans 12, um, it's easy to look at passages like this, you know, these paranetic passages, this, you know, kind of command, do good, do good, do good over and over again. They can be hard to preach. I, I think you might want to spend some time asking the congregation, what's Christian about any of this anyway? Like this is all behavior we expect from anybody. This is all behavior that any uh, good moral thinker could come up with on their own without needing to believe in God. So why are we spending time with it? And so then to kind of pull people into the question, what about this is distinctively Christian when you read it in the context of the letter? And how does it manifest a cruciform life or a cross-shaped life? And then to think about, okay, we can start to now parse all of these really common good behavior commandments in light of the cross or in light of, of, of God's work in Christ, not to like claim them then as distinctively or uniquely Christian, but to give some kind of content to them. So, you know, let love be genuine. What a great statement because there's so many forms of fake love out there. Uh, right. Corporations will tell you they love you if you buy their product um, or you're going to love this soap. Um, but what does genuine love look like informed by Jesus Christ? That to me is an interesting sermon. I appreciate uh, that in the Matthew text, uh, the commentary uh, that Richard Ward does, he points us to what do these virtues look like? And he says, there you turn to the passage in Romans for this week. And uh, so the expectations of Jesus for Jesus followers looks like this um, as, as, as Paul writes them out. And uh, in, in this trajectory of gathering together all of the peoples of those created in the image of God, so I'm going back to Genesis 1 and 2, um, if we take that perspective of the world, then those scattered that aren't descendants of Abraham and Sarah are still capable of bearing the good image of God, as you as you noted, Matt, that we can see this good outside of the church, but where does this idea of goodness comes comes come from? And we bear witness to that is that we are created as icons of a good God, and Jesus helps us to see it, and the Holy Spirit helps us to be it. And that's the message we offer the world. Your idea of good, it's good. And you are empowered to, to live that way. Not just to write it, not just to say it's the law or the expectation, but to demonstrate it so that people say, there's something about you. And then that becomes good news.